Chapter 16 of The Mentor 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Nienaber. The Mentor 2 by Various. Chapter 16. The Mentor, Number 29, Volume 1. Great American Inventors by H. Addington Bruce. Anyone who reads the history of the United States must be impressed with the supremely important part played by the inventor in the evolution of the nation. The explorer and pioneer, the statesman, diplomat, and soldier, all these have contributed, and contributed notably, to the upbuilding of the mighty republic of today. But it is beyond dispute that in the long run their efforts would have counted for comparatively little had it not been for the genius of those who have bent their energies to the devising of means for the development of the country's marvelously rich resources, and have still further added to the national wealth by the creation of unsuspected channels for the profitable employment of human enterprise and labor. It was in the humble workshops of men like Whitney, Fitch, and Fulton that, almost as soon as the independence of the United States had been won by the sword, the foundations were laid for its rise to the standing of a world power. Every invention these men made meant a gain in the nation's strength, and a wider opening of the door of opportunity to all native-born Americans, and to the constantly increasing host of newcomers from abroad. The American inventors have not simply astonished mankind, they have enhanced the prestige, power, and prosperity of their country. Take, for example, the results that have flowed from a single invention, that of the Whitney Cotton Gin. When the young Yankee schoolmaster and law student, Eli Whitney, was graduated from Yale and settled in Georgia in 1792, the production of cotton in the southern states was insignificant. At that time, indeed, cotton was grown by the Southerners chiefly for decorative effect in gardens because of its handsome flowers. Its cultivation for commercial purposes was virtually out of the question, owing to the fact that no means were available for economically separating the lint from the seed. This had to be done by hand, and since it took ten hours for a quick worker to separate one pound of lint from its three pounds of seed, no adequate returns could be had. What was needed, as his southern friends pointed out to Whitney, was the invention of some apparatus for performing the work of separation, cleanly and quickly. The problem was one that appealed to him with peculiar force. Even as a boy in Massachusetts, he had been fond of tinkering with mechanical appliances. At the early age of twelve, he had made a violin of fairly good tone. A year later, he was making excellent knives and before he was fifteen he was recognized as the best mechanic in his native town of Westboro. It was therefore with real enthusiasm that he set up a workshop in the basement of his Georgia home, and varied his law studies by experimenting in the manufacture of a cotton gin. Within a few months he had successfully completed his self-imposed task by the creation of a machine equipped with hundreds of tiny metal fingers, each of which did more work in quicker time than the human hand could possibly do. That same year, 1793, fully five million pounds of cotton were harvested in the United States, the product of a planting stimulated solely by the faith in the Whitney gin. By the year of Whitney's death, 1825, cotton was indisputably king in the commercial life of the nation. The value of the cotton exports for that year being more than thirty-six million dollars, as against a valuation of barely thirty million dollars for all other American exports. The eventual abolition of slavery served only to accentuate the stupendous importance of the cotton gin. Under free labor, the production of cotton has steadily risen, until nowadays it annually runs into the billions of pounds, with a valuation of many hundreds of millions of dollars and affords employment to not only an enormous army of cultivators, but to a still greater army of workers in factory, office, and store. Even of much greater importance have been the results of the labors of another illustrious American inventor, Robert Fulton. Born in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, in November 1765, Fulton, by reasoning of the astonishing number and variety of his inventions, may well be called the Edison of his time. Robert Fulton. 
similar to all truly great inventors he was a man of broad vision and keen imagination what he was most interested in was not immediate consequences but ultimate effects and in working on the complicated mechanical problems with which his mind was incessantly occupied he kept steadily in view their significance to society as a whole thus one of his most ingenious creations the famous fulton torpedo crude forerunner of the deadly submarine missiles of today was inspired by an ardent desire to produce something that would make war so terrible as to impel mankind to a universal peace and similarly it was with an eye to increasing the welfare and happiness of society that he went to work on the invention with which his name will always be linked the steamboat he was not the first to whom the idea had occurred of applying the steam engine to purposes of water transportation already the pennsylvanian william henry the connecticut mechanic john fitch the new jersey inventor john stevens and the scotsman william symington had demonstrated more or less successfully the possibility of using steam as a mode of power on the water but it was left to fulton to establish definitely the value of the steamboat as a medium for passenger and freight traffic this he did with his historic clermont built at new york in eighteen o seven partly with funds provided by chancellor livingston and partly by loans from reluctant and skeptical friends the general impression was that fulton had undertaken a hopeless and visionary task as i had occasion he himself has related daily to pass to and from the shipyard while my boat was in progress i often loitered unknown near idle groups of strangers gathering in little circles and heard various inquiries as to the object of this new vehicle the language was uniformly that of scorn sneer or ridicule a loud laugh often rose at my expense the dry jest the wise calculation of losses and expenditures the dull but endless repetition of fulton's folly as everybody knows the clermont did not sink or otherwise come to grief when she started up the hudson august eleventh eighteen o seven for her maiden voyage to albany on the contrary she made the journey against the wind at an average rate of nearly five miles an hour and with the wind again ahead returned to new york at about the same speed compared with the steaming powers of the modern ocean leviathan this was a sorry enough showing but with the continued success of the clermont and her sister boats the raritan and the car of neptune which together constituted the world's first regular line of steamboats it was sufficient to prove for all time that man had made another superb advance in the mastery of the forces of nature very different but also of great value was the service rendered by elias howe of sewing-machine fame there are two stories as to the genesis of this wonderful labor-saving device one is that it was suggested to howe by the chance remark of a visitor to the boston machine shop in which he was employed the other and more romantic story is that the idea of a machine for sewing garments originated from a desire on howe's part to lighten the labor of his wife who when he was ill and out of work was obliged to take in sewing and toil far into the night whichever version is correct it is certain that in eighteen forty three howe was then only twenty-four years old he set to work in the garret of his father's home in cambridge and about a year later gave to the world a sewing machine that embodied the principal features of the most up-to-date models of the present day for long however the world was reluctant to accept this splendid invention the tailors of boston to whom he first offered it refused to adopt it on the ground that it would ruin their business and later in new york there were anti-sewing machine demonstrations fomented by labor leaders who failed to realize that in the end labor-saving devices of any real merit were always certain to increase not decrease the demand and opportunities for the working man and working woman in the case of the sewing machine the truth of this has long since been demonstrated not only has it become a familiar household adjunct freeing millions of women from the slavery of the needle and thus most effectively answering the piteous plea of hood's song of the shirt but it has also brought about a marvelous expansion of the clothing industry 
it has in fact created an entirely new and most important branch of that industry the ready-made clothing business giving employment to hundreds of thousands of people and providing well-patterned and well-finished garments at prices undreamed of in other days surely howe no less than fulton and whitney deserves to be regarded as a benefactor of humanity so too with samuel f b morse and alexander graham bell the one the father of the electric telegraph the other the inventor of the telephone if anybody had told samuel morse in eighteen eleven when as a youth of twenty he sailed from new york to liverpool to study painting under benjamin west that he would be known to posterity as an inventor rather than an artist he would have laughed the prophecy to scorn but as has happened to other gifted men circumstances conspired to turn and fix the thoughts of this brilliant son of new england on problems unconnected with the routine of his daily life yet appealing to him with such force as to change the whole course of his career the first telegraph instrument with morse the turning point was reached in eighteen twenty seven when some years after his return from england he attended a course of lectures in new york on the subject of electromagnetism what he then heard fired his imagination and led him during a second visit abroad to study more closely the nature of electricity he especially became interested in the possibility of utilizing this great natural force as a medium for long-distance communication and when homeward bound in the autumn of eighteen thirty two applied himself to this one problem to such good purpose that before landing in new york he was able to show to his fellow passengers plans of the instrument that was to immortalize his name it was not until five years afterward however that morse made the first working demonstration of his invention which by most people was regarded as a scientific toy rather than a creation of the highest practical utility and a scientific toy it remained until after a heart-breaking struggle to secure the necessary financial aid morse persuaded congress in eighteen forty three to appropriate thirty thousand dollars for the construction of a telegraph line between washington and baltimore the first message to be flashed over this line may first eighteen forty four was the news of the nomination of henry clay for the presidency and with the sending of that message one of the greatest inventions in the history of mankind definitely gained recognition as an accomplished fact alexander graham bell experimenting in the same field of long-distance communication by the aid of electricity was more fortunate in securing early acknowledgment of the merits of his telephone a public demonstration of which was given at the centennial exhibition in eighteen seventy six connected with this invention a most interesting story is told bell it is said was experimenting with a device for multiplex telegraphy when the accidental snapping of a wire sent a sound vibrating through another wire which had attached to it at each end a thin sheet-iron disc a few inches in circumference at once bell asked himself if the sound could be repeated experiment showed that it could and the query then suggested itself to him could vocal sounds be thus transmitted forthwith he set himself to the task that resulted after many failures in the creation of the telephone but even in the case of this marvelous instrument it was for a long time impossible to obtain the necessary financial support when in eighteen seventy seven bell took the telephone to england he could find no purchaser for half the european rights at ten thousand dollars and in this country a personal friend declined to advance twenty five hundred dollars for a half interest today so it is stated there are in use in the united states alone approximately seven and a half million telephones edison the master inventor never has there been an american inventor who has contributed more abundantly than thomas alva edison to the republic's industrial expansion nor one who has achieved greatness under a heavier handicap of early disadvantages born eighteen forty seven of a poor family in an obscure ohio canal village edison began his career at the age of twelve in the occupation of a railway newsboy it was as a telegrapher which he became at eighteen that his inventive genius first displayed itself 
one after another various devices for improving telegraphic service flowed from his fertile mind until after his astonishing success in inventing a duplex and quadruplex telegraph he was able to command the support of a group of new york capitalists in carrying through a long series of experiments that finally resulted in the invention of the now familiar edison electric light had it been for only this one invention edison's name would be gratefully remembered for all time but to strengthen his claims on the gratitude of his countrymen and of posterity there has since come from his new jersey laboratory a succession of inventions to name only a few the phonograph the kinetoscope the mimeograph the storage battery and the talking movie pictures which have meant new openings for capital new opportunities for labor and an incalculable enlargement of the resources of the human race whitney fulton howe morse bell edison clearly it is only simple historic justice to rate these great inventors with the great statesmen warriors and pioneers who in days gone by have won undying fame as makers of the american republic eli whitney one a machine said to have paid off the debts of the south greatly increased its capital and trebled the value of its land was the invention of eli whitney this machine was the cotton gin and like many another inventor whitney was regarded with ingratitude he added hundreds of millions to the wealth of our country and in return had to endure humiliation and vexation of body and spirit Eli Whitney was born at Westboro, Massachusetts, on December 8, 1765. He early showed great mechanical ability, and by the time he was 23 years old, had earned enough money to enable him to enter Yale. After graduating, he went to Savannah, Georgia, with the hope of becoming a teacher there. He was disappointed in this, but made the acquaintance of Mrs. Nathaniel Green, widow of the Revolutionary General, and paid a visit to her plantation. When he was there, some men who were also visiting Mrs. Green happened one day to lament the fact that there was no machine for cleaning the staple cotton of its seeds. This work had to be done by hand, and was very slow. Separating one pound of the clean staple from the seed was a day's work for a negro woman. Suddenly Mrs. Green turned to them. Gentlemen, she said, apply to my friend here, Mr. Whitney. He can make anything." and she showed them several contrivances the young northerner had made whitney modestly said that he did not know how successful he would be but that he would try in a few weeks he produced a model consisting of a wooden cylinder encircled by rows of slender spikes set half an inch apart which extended between the bars of a grid set so closely together that the seeds could not pass but the lint was pulled through by the revolving spikes a revolving brush cleaned the spikes, and the seed fell into another compartment. This machine could clean fifty pounds of cotton a day, as compared with one pound a day cleaned by hand. Whitney formed a partnership with Phineas Miller, who later married Mrs. Green, and they built a factory at New Haven to make cotton gins. This place was burned to the ground in March 1795, and the partners were plunged into debt several infringements of their patent then appeared to discourage them still more and it was not until eighteen o seven that whitney's rights were established in the meanwhile however the inventor became disgusted with the struggle and began manufacturing firearms for the government this proved profitable and he greatly improved the methods of making arms but from the cotton gin he received little revenue his last years were the happiest in 1817 he married Henrietta Edwards, the youngest daughter of Judge Pierpont Edwards of Connecticut. They had four children, a son and three daughters. Whitney died in New Haven on January 8, 1825. Robert Fulton, 2. Robert Fulton was not the inventor of the steamboat. He was, however, the first man to apply the power of the steam engine to the propulsion of boats in a practical and effective manner. Born of poor parents at Little Britain, now Fulton, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, in 1765, he received only the scantiest education, but early showed promise of becoming an excellent artist. 
at the age of seventeen he took up painting seriously and supported himself thus in philadelphia until he was twenty-one then he bought a farm in washington county but soon after was strongly advised to go to england for the purpose of studying art under the american benjamin west there he met earl stanhope duke of bridgewater who interested him in engineering in seventeen ninety four he took out an english patent for superseding canal locks by inclined planes he also invented about this time a new method for sawing marble a machine for spinning flax and another for making ropes soon after this he went to paris and built a submarine the nautilus this boat was tried in brest harbor in eighteen o one before a commission appointed by napoleon bonaparte and fulton succeeded in blowing up a small vessel anchored there for that purpose two years later at paris he was also successful in propelling a boat by steam power fulton returned to america and in partnership with robert livingston constructed the first american steamboat the clermont this was launched in the spring of eighteen o seven and its success caused a great sensation the principle of propelling boats by steam was now proved the clermont was soon established as a regular passenger boat between new york and albany fulton built the demologous or fulton the first for the united states government during the years eighteen fourteen and eighteen fifteen this was the first steam battleship ever constructed in february eighteen fifteen the inventor caught cold from exposure and rapidly became worse on february twenty fourth he died mourned by every one who had known the man and his achievements elias howe three it is a remarkable fact that some of the greatest and most useful inventions have been bitterly opposed by the very persons whom they were designed to help the bowmen of olden time resented the introduction of guns the stagecoach lines tried in every way to block the building of railways and elias howe the inventor of one of the greatest labor-saving devices in the world the sewing machine was ridiculed discouraged and denounced as an enemy of poor sewing women the ones whose toil he was seeking to lighten they imagined that with the introduction of the sewing machine their occupation would be taken away elias howe was born at spencer massachusetts on july ninth eighteen nineteen one of a family of eight children his father was a farmer and miller and elias early years were spent in the mill at the same time he managed to pick up a smattering of education he went to lowell massachusetts in eighteen thirty five to work in a cotton mill two years later he obtained a place in a cambridge machine shop in which his cousin nathaniel p banks afterward governor of massachusetts was also employed howe married at the age of twenty one and moved to boston it was there that the first germs of his great idea became implanted in his brain to increase the family income his wife did sewing at night as howe watched her slowly and laboriously stitching a seam his inventive mind sought and sought for some way to decrease her toil he had a natural bent for mechanics and it was not long before he had constructed the first crude sewing machine this was in october eighteen forty four but although he now had his idea he lacked money to prove its value however a man named fisher in cambridge liked his invention and agreed to board howe and his family and to advance five hundred dollars in return for a half interest in the patent by the middle of next may howe had constructed a machine which did sewing that promised to outlast the cloth but the invention was opposed everywhere in america finally in eighteen forty six howe's brother amasa went to england and managed to sell the english rights in the machine for twelve hundred fifty dollars to a william thomas this man also gave elias howe a place in his factory at fifteen dollars a week but he treated the inventor shamefully and howe threw up the situation he sent his family back to america ahead of him and then returned himself he landed in new york with less than a dollar in his pocket and was met with the news that his wife was dying of consumption at cambridge he managed to borrow some money and reached her side just before she passed away these were howe's darkest days 
Imitations of his machine were infringing on his patent, and he had to begin several suits to establish his rights. He and another man now began to manufacture sewing machines in a small way. It was during this time that the sewing machine riots took place. But soon the real value of the invention was seen, and all opposition ceased. Brighter times began for the inventor. He won his patent suits, and by 1863 his royalties were estimated at $4,000 a day. At the Paris Exposition of 1867 he was awarded a gold medal and the ribbon of the Legion of Honor. His last years were happy ones. He died on October 3, 1867. Samuel F. B. Morse, 4. The story has been told that the first words that ever came over a telegraph instrument were, What hath God wrought? And that they were spelled out by Samuel F. B. Morse, the inventor of the telegraphic code. This was supposed to have taken place in 1844 in Baltimore, and to have proclaimed the fact that Morse's dream of telegraphy had become a reality. We are now told on good authority that this was not the first message to be sent by telegraph, nor was Morse the sender of the words. Instead, it was sent by one of the committee who were debating upon the proposal of Morse, the inventor, to string a telegraph line from Baltimore to Washington. Morse, who wanted to end the discussion and at the same time demonstrate his invention, strung a wire from the committee room to the top of the Capitol. One of the committee who was opposed to President Tyler wrote, Tyler deserves to be hanged. This was received by the man at the other end, exactly as it was composed. Samuel Finley Brees Morse was born at Charlestown, Massachusetts, on April 27, 1791. He was the son of the Reverend Jedediah Morse and the great-grandson of Samuel Finley, the second president of the College of New Jersey at Princeton. Morse entered Yale at the age of fourteen, which was not considered extremely young in those days. It was there that he first began the study of electricity, but his tastes led him more strongly toward art than toward science, and in 1811 the young graduate became the pupil of Washington Alston and went with him to England. Here he remained four years, distinguishing himself with his brush and making many friends. During the next few years the young artist traveled about New England, painting portraits for the sum of fifteen dollars apiece. Later he increased his price to sixty dollars a portrait, doing an average of four a week. By the money thus earned he was enabled to marry Miss Lucretia P. Walker on October 6, 1818. In 1825 Morse was one of the founders of the National Academy of Design, and was its first president, from 1826 until 1845. He made a second visit to Europe in 1829, and traveled about the continent for three years before returning to New York. During all this time, however, while he was working at his art, Morse's mind had also been occupied with another interest. That was electromagnetism, and the possibility of communication between far distant places by means of it. It was on board the ship Sully, in which he was returning to America, that he said, If the presence of electricity can be made visible in any part of the circuit, I see no reason why intelligence may not be transmitted by electricity. And in a few days he had finished some rough plans of an apparatus to do this. But it was a twelve years' struggle against poverty and discouragement before he could get any apparatus that would work. Finally, however, he was successful in this, and after taking out a patent, applied to Congress for the money to experiment with a telegraph over a circuit of sufficient length to test its possibility and value. After long delay, he was at last granted this in 1843. A line was built from Baltimore to Washington, and on May 24, 1844, Miss Ellsworth, daughter of the Commissioner of Patents, sent the first message from the Chamber of the Supreme Court in Washington to Baltimore. Three years later, Morse was compelled to defend his invention in the courts, and successfully proved his claim to be called the inventor of the electromagnetic recording telegraph. He married for the second time in 1848. In 1871, a bronze statue of Morse was erected in Central Park, New York City, and the following year, on April 2nd, the great inventor died, simple, dignified, and kindly to the end.
Alexander Graham Bell, five. One hot afternoon in June, about forty years ago, a young man was standing in a grimy workshop by the side of a crude little machine composed of a clock spring reed, a magnet, and a wire. He was bending over this queer machine, listening intently. Suddenly he bent nearer, a startled look of excitement upon his face. From the clock spring had come a faint, almost inaudible sound. The young man straightened up and ran into an adjoining room where another man stood near a second instrument, similar to the first. "'Snap that reed again!' he cried excitedly. The assistant obeyed him, and again came that faint twang from the spring in the front room. The telephone was born, and the man who accomplished this wonder was a poor young professor of elocution in Boston, Alexander Graham Bell. He was not an American by birth. He was born in Edinburgh, Scotland, on March 1, 1847. His father was Alexander Melville Bell, the inventor of a system by which the deaf can read speech by observing the motion of the lips. The Bell family moved to Canada in 1870, and Alexander, the younger, took up teaching the deaf and dumb in Boston. He became instructor of phonetics, or the science of articulate sound, in Monroe School of Oratory. He was a hard worker, but poor. One time, when he had rheumatism, his employer had to pay his hospital expenses. It was about this time that Bell began experimenting with the transmission of sound by electricity. For a number of years other people had been trying to do this. Sir Charles Wheatstone in England had discovered that wires charged with electricity often carried noises in a curious way. In 1869, Rice, our German professor, constructed an instrument that sent a series of clicks along an electric wire to an electromagnetic receiver at the other end, and others were turning their attention to this interesting phase of telegraphy. But it was Alexander Graham Bell who first succeeded in grasping the correct idea. A few months after the incident described above, on a day in January 1876, he called some of his pupils into a room and showed them an instrument that transmitted singing from the cellar of the building to where they were on the fourth floor. People were at first slow to appreciate the importance of this great invention, but gradually they came to see its value, and today there are over seven million telephones in use in the United States alone. Money and honors have poured in upon the inventor, who still lives to enjoy his triumph. His income is said to be more than one million dollars a year. In 1880, the French government awarded him the Volta Prize of ten thousand dollars, and two years later he received from the same country the ribbon of the Legion of Honor. Thomas Alva Edison, six. The scene: the Boston office of a great telegraph company. The time: a half century ago. Enter a tall young man wearing a slouchy, broad-brimmed hat and a wet duster clinging to his legs, who marches into the superintendent's office and says, Here I am. The superintendent gazes at him. Who are you? he finally asks. Tom Edison. And who on earth might Tom Edison be? The young man explains that he has been ordered to report for duty at the Boston office. He is told to sit down and wait. A little while later, a New York sender, who was one of the most rapid in the telegraph business at the time, calls up. All the operators are busy. "'Let that new fellow try him,' says the chief. Edison sits down, and for four and one-half hours takes the speedy messages. The faster the instrument clicks, the faster he writes the words. At the end, New York calls, "'Hello!' "'Hello yourself,' Edison flashes back. "'Who the dickens are you?' asks the New York operator." Tom Edison. You're the first man in the country that could ever take me at my fastest, clicks out New York, and the only one who could ever sit at the other end of my wire for more than two hours and a half. I'm proud to know you. This little story of Thomas Alva Edison shows that even as a young man he exhibited unusual ability. He was born on February 11, 1847, at Milan, Erie County, Ohio. His family moved to Port Huron, Michigan, when the boy was seven, and when he was only twelve years old, Edison became a trained newsboy on the railway to Detroit. It was during this time that he rigged up apparatus in the baggage car and experimented with chemistry and telegraphy. He was but fifteen when he became a telegraph operator, 
but his studies and experiments interfered so much with his duties that he was discharged many times. He worked in a number of cities of the United States and Canada. At the age of twenty-one he had built an automatic repeater, by which a telegraphic message could be transferred from one wire to another without the aid of an operator. By means of this, messages could be sent directly to a much greater distance than formerly. Edison finally went to Boston, as related herein, and thence to New York in 1869. There he invented an improved printing telegraph for stock quotations, the ticker. For this he received $40,000. Then he built a laboratory at Newark, New Jersey, but four years later moved to Menlo Park, and later to West Orange, New Jersey. All the time he continued his experiments and inventions. He lives now at Orange, and is as hard a worker as he was when he was a young man. Among Edison's more important inventions are his system of multiplex telegraphy, the carbon telephone transmitter, the phonograph, the incandescent lamp and light system, the kinetoscope, and the talking moving picture. In all, he has had 700 patents granted to him. In 1878, Edison was made Chevalier, and afterward Commander of the Legion of Honor by the French government. End of chapter 16